This video will explore the Gilded Age mansion known as Kelso or the Cassatt House located in Upper Marion, Pennsylvania. J. Gardner Cassatt was a financier born in 1849. He married Eugenia Jenny Carter of Virginia seven years his junior in October 1882. He was the brother of the Impressionist painter Mary Cassatt and Alexander J. Cassatt, an engineer, collector, and later president of the Pennsylvania Railroad. Mr. Gardner Cassatt died in 1911. The family was heavily involved in the Impressionist movement. Whistler painted the portrait of J.G. Cassatt's sister-in-law, Lois Cassatt, née Buchanan, the niece of James Buchanan, 15th President of the United States in 1883, in his painting Arrangement in Black No. 8. J.G. Cassatt saw the painting in September of that year and described it as a fine and artistic portrait, although Whistler himself later admitted it is not a striking likeness. The story of J. Gardner Cassatt and his estate starts in the previous century. His family, many years resident of Pittsburgh, moved to Hardwick, a country place a mile beyond Lancaster, Pennsylvania, in 1848. He was born there on January 13, 1849, the youngest of five children who survived to maturity. Two others died young. No white privilege here. Gardner Cassatt was named for his father's brother-in-law, Dr. Joseph Gardner. His father, Robert Simpson Cassatt, was a successful banker who, before moving east, served as mayor and president of the Select Council in Allegheny City, a suburb which is now part of Pittsburgh. After just two years in Lancaster, Robert Cassatt moved the family again to a newly developed residential area west of Broad Street in Philadelphia to manage his railroad affairs. Gardner's eldest brother by 10 years, Alexander, born in 1839 and dying in 1906, is well known not only for his work on the Pennsylvania Railroad, but also for his home in Haverford called Cheswold and for his horse farm at Chesterbrook. He also had a sister, Mary, born in 1844, dying in 1926, who we know through her famous painting. Gardner himself founded Cassatt & Company, an investment business in Philadelphia. This firm was acquired by Merrill Lynch in 1940, shortly after Merrill's merger with E.A. Pierce & Company that created Merrill Lynch, E.A. Pierce and Cassatt. The Cassatt name was dropped in 1940 when the newly combined firm acquired New Orleans-based Fenner & Bean. By 1919, though, the Cassatt & Company investment firm had offices in Philly, New York, Pittsburgh, and Baltimore. In 1931, the firm was going through hardship and split its investment banking business from its traditional brokerage business. We could speculate that Gardner decided to build his own estate along Berwyn Paoli Road to rival his older brother at nearby Chesterbrook. Many say Gardner hired the well-known Philadelphia architectural firm of Cope and Stewartson. Others say the house was designed by a firm from York, Pennsylvania. But there is a record that between 1906 and 1908, this house was constructed out of a distinctive Flemish bond brick. As of 1992, the chimneys and the windows and a number of architectural features inside the house have remained the same. So we see an architectural legacy that the YMCA, who would buy the building, carried on while serving the community with programs dedicated to building healthy spirit, mind, and body. For background on the property, Tradifferent Easttown Historical Society called the Easttown Township Manager, Gene Williams. He disclaimed any personal knowledge, but he did say, I have in my office an 1880s Chester County map, and I'll lend it to you. The map was included in an atlas known as Bro's Farm Maps. Mr. Bro from Lancaster County was called to Chester County to do tax maps for the county commissioners. 
That 1883 map shows the 54 acres of the current property plus the 70 acre development is the same 124 acres owned by Jonathan Morris in 1883. This is notable because so many properties have been divided up for developments in America. The size and shape of the parcel is the same as the one the Cassatt family developed in 1906 as their summer estate, which they called Kelso. Now, how do we know it was called Kelso when it's been referred to as the Cassatt Mansion? Maps of the era show the name. Gardner's maternal grandmother in Pittsburgh was named Kelso. He would name one of his daughters Kelso. The former dairy barn located outside the Y on Foxall Lane is now a private residence. Its owner has a milk bottle showing the name Kelso. So Kelso became the formal name of the Cassatt estate. The Gardner Cassatt family maintained their primary residence in town at 1418 Spruce Street in Philly, which I think has been knocked down or converted into apartments. Philadelphia, unfortunately, has a very poor record of historic preservation. What was it like to have a summer house out in Chester County in the early 1900s, just before World War I, in these halcyon days of Western youth, before they were gunned down by globalist forces in Europe? First of all, you needed farmers to farm the land. A large farmer's house still exists today at the end of Foxhall Lane. Secondly, a bank barn was constructed or rebuilt adjacent to the farmhouse in that same area. On a winter day, you can see the barn structure from the right from the YMCA parking lot. It has been remodeled into a residence. How do we know it's connected to the main house? Well, the architecture is the same and uses the same style brick as the main house and stable. Maps show the barn built at the same time as the mansion house in 1906. A third outbuilding located just east of the mansion is referred to as the carriage house. Today, it's the YMCA Family Center. This structure was renovated in 1967, shortly after the Y bought the property. There is also an environmental center, which was a garage. Unfortunately, the old brick spring house by the stream has been destroyed. However, a local Boy Scout troop created a set of trails along the stream. On Foxhall Lane, there is a small building, now a residence, which was used either as a chicken house or pheasant house. In the early 1900s, a summer estate would be self-sufficient. It would not be uncommon for a wealthy owner coming from the urban center of Philadelphia to the countryside of the main line to raise his own poultry for elegant meals. That would explain its use and why that house was built of the same brick as the main house and the barn. This self-sufficiency harks back to centuries-old writings of our founding father, Thomas Jefferson, who dreamed that every American would be a farmer. So, Kelso Farm became a self-sufficient summer estate around the time of World War I. One bit of local lore, supported by Mary Cassatt's biographer, Frederick Sweet, has it that she visited the mansion. Sweet says, in the fall of 1908, she decided to come to America from Paris and spend Christmas in Philadelphia with her brother Gardner. At this time, she had her only visit at his elaborate new country house, Kelso, which was built in 1907 at Dalesford near Berwyn. Reviewing original correspondence, including two letters written by Mary Cassatt during that stay on the stationery of Gardner's Philadelphia townhouse at 1418 Spruce Street, dated December 22, 1908, and January 1909, which established that she was there and she did see his new house in the country while visiting Philadelphia. It is my belief that in her paintings of pond scenes, she is relying directly on Cassatt Pond in Kelso. Mrs. Meeg's mother, Ellen Mary Cassatt Hare, born 1894, was the painter's favorite niece and was often as a child the subject of her portraits. In 1926, she inherited Mary Cassatt's country estate outside Paris named Chateau de Beaufrais. It exists today as an orphanage. Gilded Age heiresses giving their French property to establish orphanages was not uncommon. Edith Wharton did the same, and you can learn more about Wharton on this channel. 
Ellen Mary's brother, Joseph Gardner Cassatt Jr., was a son who was also painted by Mary Cassatt. He was born in 1886 and baptized in Atlantic City. A daughter, Ellen Mary Hare, was born in 1894, and another daughter, Eugenia Cassatt, named for her mother, was born in 1897. At this time, Cassatt was a 48-year-old father to three babies. In 1910, J. Gardner Cassatt listed his residence as Ward 7 in Philadelphia, not Kelso. In 1911, J. Gardner Cassatt died suddenly in Paris at age 62 after becoming sick while traveling abroad with his wife. Mrs. Meigs, Cassatt's granddaughter, was not born until 1925. She lived on the summer place built by her grandfather and occupied by her mother and father, Horace Binney Hare. The family actively used the pond, playhouse, and all of the open space riding horses with carriage rides. During World War II, the cost of heating the mansion house was significant with the coal shortages, and so it was occupied only seasonally. In about 1950, the year Mrs. Meigs married, the family decided that with the reduced use and the maintenance costs, as well as taxes, it was time to sell the estate. At the time, the estate occupied the same 124 acres that it had in 1906, but it was no longer a self-sufficient farm due in part to a lack of tariffs making farming much easier for Pennsylvania farmers. A local broker subdivided the property in 1951. The Norbertine Order bought 54 acres, including the mansion, and the 70-some acres to the east of Foxhall Lane were developed into houses, and new ra roads named Country and Abbey were opened. The township records and subdivision maps show a preference for Tudor construction, and they built 54 units there in 1957. Longtime residents, Mr. and Mrs. McGarry of Berwyn Paoli Road, remember that the entrance to Kelso was much more grand than it is now. Prior to the purchase in the early 1950s, the Norbertine Order were a new organization of about a dozen brothers based in Wisconsin, whose mission was down in South Philadelphia teaching at Southeast Catholic High School, now called Bishop Newman High. They would come out to this area in the summer. Somehow they learned that the Cassatt family was selling their estate, so the Wisconsin-based order bought the house, and they were also involved in the St. Norbert Parish in nearby Paoli. The years that Father Antry lived here as one of the brethren saw use of the estate for religious st services, study, walks about the pond, and essentially was a quiet retreat. There was one tennis court while the brothers were here. The order still holds photos of beautiful azaleas, members of the order in their white robes, and a wonderful setting for a life of contemplation and meditation at Kelso. Today, the Norbertine order numbers more than 1,300 members worldwide, including priests, sisters, brothers, deacons, and novices. And Norbertine abbeys and convents are established and active in 23 countries. In the United States, Norbertine Foundations are in Wisconsin, Chicago, Paoli, Pennsylvania, Middletown, Delaware, Albuquerque, New Mexico, and Silverado, California. History hasn't always been kind to the Norbertines, however. Among the more difficult periods, they had to navigate the bloodbath of the French Revolution, which fomented hatred towards the Catholic Church and innumerable priests. Many Catholics were killed, including St. Pierre-Adrien Tlorge, who spent most of the revolution in hiding so he could celebrate Holy Mass and the sacraments in secret, sparing the lives of his flock. Tlorge was arrested in 1793 and sentenced to the guillotine. The Thirty Years' War saw the destruction of many houses. In all, about 90 abbeys were shuttered during the French Revolution, also affecting the Norbertines. With that kind of history, to have made it 900 years, it's something just to celebrate the fact that you've survived, says Dalesford Abbey's father, Andrew Saferni, chair of the board of trustees at St. Norbert College in De Pere, Wisconsin. And yet, as it always has been, Norbert's vision of the world and of brotherhood is being tested still today. 
A more immediate challenge is how to live a life in common amid so much polarization, says Father Bradley R. Vanden Branden of St. Norbert Abbey in De Pere, Wisconsin. The seed that grew to become the Upper Main Line YMCA was planted during a bridge game in 1960 as neighbors discussed the need for a community center. The seeds sprouted in May 1962 when money was raised to begin the YMCA. For the first one and a half years, the YMCA's house was a small house in Berwyn. The YMCA then purchased the Norbertine property in 1964. This is a great story because we see the thread of Christian brethren from the Cassatt family to the Norbertine Brotherhood to the Young Men's Christian Association, the YMCA, through the property um, purchases. The first YMCA facilities built on the Upper Main Line site were in 1965, and they were four outdoor tennis courts, an outdoor lap pool, and a baby pool. In the years that followed, additional outdoor tennis courts and pools were built. In 1971, one outdoor pool was enclosed and the health center, exercise room, and locker rooms were constructed. The YMCA continued to expand and I believe is now called the Brandywine YMCA. The YMCA invested over $100,000 in replacing the aging roof and in so doing protected the architectural integrity of the Kelso roof line, which has wonderful chimneys and gargoyles on top. This effort stabilized the mansion so the third floor will remain watertight and secure, and the roof's appearance continues a wonderful legacy of the past architectural style. The same cannot be said for all YMCA buildings on site, which are a mixture of glass and concrete, reflecting modern brutalist style instead of our beloved Art Deco or Gilded Age uh, French Empire styles. The following is an interview conducted with Mrs. Meigs about her memories living in Kelso. It was the swimming pool which no longer exists. It was fed by a stream, cold water. Where on the property would this pool have been? Well, it was above the present pond, Cassatt Pond. You had to walk from the house down through the fields. There was a driveway that came all the way through to Sugartown Road. A pair of brick gate posts still stand there, surrounded by vegetation. The pond would have been down by Sugartown Road, and the swimming pool would have been up closer to the house. Is this the same pool that exists today? Yes. I even have some pictures. There was a little hut and it was our playhouse, but not here. It was up where the swimming pool was. We got it from Bryn Mawr College when they had their May Day in 1936. The Norbertine brothers used to put their bathing suits on in there, a changing room. Mrs. Meigs, when you were growing up here, did you have brothers and sisters? One brother. We were very isolated. We had no one to play with but ourselves, and a friend across the way and two more friends down the road. I was taught at home until I was 11. Then I attended leopard school for one year to get used to school before entering Shipley School for Girls. What kind of support staff did it take to run the house? Did you have a cook housekeeper? Yes, we had a cook and a waitress and a parlor maid and there was a chambermaid and a floating maid who took over the chores of whichever staff member had a day off. Each one of them had 24 hours off every two weeks. All of their families lived in Philadelphia, so they had to take the train at the Berwyn station into town, spend their time off, and come back. They lived in the house on the third floor. The cook, who was the highest paid member of the staff, earned $60 a month. The train line still exists and is called the R5. Stable and garden work was done by a gardener and a groom. The groom and his wife lived over the carriage house and stable, which has been converted into what is now the senior center of the YMCA. Were there occupants in the farmhouse? Yes, the farm was rented. We had nothing to do with that. We would go over and look at the cows and feed the pigs. Was the estate known at, as Kelso at the time? It was. That was a family name of my great-grandmother Cassatt, Catherine Kelso Johnston. The Johnston family came from Kelso on Tweed in Scotland. 
The formal garden covered the area that today is swimming pools and indoor tennis courts. A wrought iron gate to the right of the front door opened into an area of tall oak trees and flowering crab apple. Delphinium, larkspur, zinnias, peonies, baby's breath, and sweet william bloomed behind a hedge. It was a wonderful place to play. Is the building just east of the main house, the carriage house? It was also the stable. When you were here, what kind of horses did you keep? We had hunters. We would go fox hunting. What was it like inside the mansion when you were growing up here? Well, the hall was exactly the way it is now. It's been beautifully saved and preserved. The only thing that is different is not having the staircase. If you go in today around the front desk and you were to turn and face backwards the way you came in, the staircase went straight up to that landing where the colored glass window is located. Speaking of the windows and colored glass, there was an article in the Suburban about the mansion. They came out and photographed the stained glass. Do you have any stories about the glass? I wish I did. I don't know where the windows come from. They might be Tiffany. I have no idea. Today, they're in an office built on the landing. You can see the glass from the outside. In your time, they were in the open stairway? Yes. Has the glass been moved? They're still there, but the internal space is an office. Do you have a favorite story about an elevator or a meal or something that went on in the house? Well, there is a story about the elevator. Luckily, it turned out all right. We had an elevator. There is a space where the elevator was, and it says danger elevator. That's right. If you go over by the main desk, there is such a sign. There is a sign, but this elevator was situated in the back hall, and it went all the way up. I don't know if it went by to the third floor or not, but it went to the second floor. One day, my nurse walked into it by mistake, thinking she was going to the linen closet and unfortunately fell to the ground floor. The poor woman had the presence of mind to grab the rope and she slid down, avoiding serious injury. All she did was skin her hands, terribly lucky. Just to show you how parents were in those days, though the house was fully staffed, it happened to be this nurse who was to take care of me that night. My parents were supposed to go out to dinner and they gave it up because the nurse was my nurse and she had hurt herself and they didn't trust anybody else to take care of me. Did you ever have any paintings or sketches done by Mary Cassatt in your family? They had quite a few, but they're all sold now. You personally never remember meeting Mary Cassatt? No, she died in June of 1926 and I was born in September 1925. All I have is a telegram that my parents received. Her country house in France is now an orphanage. My mother gave it to a group in France. Now, an interview with Father Antry, who lived in the house after its sale. Father Antry, can you match that story with your experiences living here for 10 years during the 1950s and 1960s? Well, I have an elevator story too, but it's more humorous. When I lived in the house, it was a different situation than when Ellen Mary lived there. It was a religious community and it was before Vatican II and things were very strict. At the end of night prayers at 9.30 p.m., there was absolutely no talking until after breakfast the next morning. There was a bathroom on the second floor. Between the first hour of office, which was the prayer service and the meditation, I went up to use the bathroom. The doorknob came off and I thought, well, one of our priests goes out to say mass in Berwyn. He will get me out. The bathroom was over the back porch roof, so I figured I'll holler down in a stage whisper. I'm locked in. Well, it was the prior going out. I thought, no way, I'll stay here forever. Finally, after about half an hour, I managed to get the doorknob turned. I, turn, I came back downstairs again and someone whispered, whispered, where were you? I said I was locked in the bathroom. The elevator story is humorous, but everything was very strict in those days. When we came into the order back in 1957, we were 18 years old. We were right out of high school, so we tended to fool around. One night, we were trying to get a gallon of ice cream up to the upstairs and somebody outside the kitchen put the tub of ice cream on the elevator and they were pulling it up. That's why I think it went to the third floor. All of a sudden, one of the priests was coming down the stairs. We had to let it go and the ice cream went crashing to the first floor again. What was it like in the 1950s? Was it a rural area where there are estates with horses and carriages? Or was it a quiet retreat? For us, it was a quiet retreat. We had the same property boundaries that the YMCA has now. There were some houses since built to the east. 
We were confined to the area, so the whole property was prayer, work, recreation. In the winter, we would skate on the pond. In the summer, we had the pool, and we had we would wander around this whole estate and not see a car go by, even if we went to the front road. Now, cars go by all the time. Where was the main entrance? The main entrance was on Berwyn Paoli Road, east of where the YMCA enters now. If you go out and take a right, there is an entryway farther to the east. A little farther to the south, you have the brick pilasters, or whatever they are, on Sugartown Road. All along there, there were dogwood trees. There were originally lovely poplar trees, and they were all dying. Would you customarily wear the right white robes? Yes, the only time you ever took off the white robes in those days if you were, was if you were doing manual labor or for recreation, if you were playing basketball or something like that. What were the circumstances that led, after 10 years, to the Norbertine Order of moving over to South Valley Road? We had a number of lay brothers who would not be priests or clerics, and they usually did the manual labor. We had a prior at the time, the second prior, and he thought if we had a bigger piece of property, we could do some farming and raise our own food. So we looked for another place, and that's when the order acquired the Hessenbruch property in Paoli, and we moved over there. It's a larger area. We bought this property. It was sold in 1950. A year later, we bought half of what was sold. So we came here in 1951. For the first three years, it was used as a kind of summer residence. The order could have retreats out here. The reason they came out here in the first place was to find a peaceful environment. When the Norbertines came to Philadelphia, they were at Southeast Catholic High School. It was right by the Italian market. These guys came from Wisconsin, a farm area with wide open spaces, and they were looking for a place where they could come out and get fresh air and get away from all the noise. So they'd come out here. Then in 1954, three years after they bought Kelso, they opened up an addition, a place for training of new people coming into the order. About how many residents were situated in the house at that time? The first class had 10. I was the fourth class. I came in 1957. There were seven of us. The first year I lived at Kelso, we had about 28 people. All living in the mansion, essentially in bunk rooms. Well, some had their own rooms upstairs, the smaller rooms. My first year I was on the second floor. I had a room overlooking the front circle. There were four of us in there. How was the downstairs used at that time in terms of having a chapel and the dining room? If you go into the main door of the YMCA now, there's a registration desk. That's where the main staircase was. Also, there's still a door to the basement that would go down into the basement. And if you went around and then came up the main staircase, then went up and circled around on the other side. But if you go straight in, there's a hallway down to the right. Beyond the hallway, also on the right, facing the field was our chapel. This is where we would pray and have mass. It's an area that has been very well preserved today and an area that YMCA people enjoy, still enjoy. The, the, it was for meetings and it was part of the divine office too. The fireplace is still there. In fact, many of the rooms had fireplaces. Yes, the YMCA has tried to maintain the interior in a satisfactory fashion. You can still identify some of the fireplaces and some of the wonderful hand-carved woodwork images which are still intact. Tell us about the members of the order's lifestyle. Basically, it was a regimented life. You got up at 5 in the morning, you started morning prayer at 5.30, you had meditation, and then you would attend mass followed by breakfast. Then you would have class. Then, as novices, you would have a work period. It could be cleaning windows, dusting, mowing the lawn. Then you would have another segment of the divine office. Then you would have lunch. Then you would have recreation. Then, in the afternoon, you would either have study time or work period, followed by more office. Study time, dinner, back and forth like that. Two afternoons a week, you were free. We would play baseball or go for a walk. In the summer, you could go swimming or ice skating in the winter. We would have visiting day once a month or so, so your family could go out and see you. You either visited with them on the first floor inside in the winter, or in summer they had a lot of benches outside so you could sit around. One of the nice things about Kelso, because we were so many people there, you didn't have everybody with the same visiting time. So you got to know the parents of the guys you came in with. When you enter the YMCA today, behind the main desk in the spatial 
spacious paneled entrance hall, there is a plaque dedicated to the memory of J. Gardner Cassatt by his daughters, Ellen Mary Cassatt Hare and Eugenia Kelso Cassatt Madeira. In 1964, the family donated money to the Capital Funds Drive, which raised over 200 grand to restore the mansion. And in turn, the YMCA has done a wonderful thing by preserving that estate and its legacy. If only it could build in the same architectural style. It's difficult to accurately convey all of the culture in this one Gilded Age family, the Cassatts. From painting to riding to architecture to farming to gardening, the Cassatt family stood for something greater than itself. While they owned property in France, the Cassatts were always eager to spend family time at Kelso and employed many locals in the house and farm. Today, Gilded Age quote-unquote robber barons get a bad rep, but one has to remember their commitment to America and its people, whether through train lines or mines or shipbuilding. Last time I checked, today's celebrities have yet to build a massive public library or donate a mansion to the YMCA or run an effective farm.